Hi, this is Ryan Bloom. On today's episode of the Fireside Chat, we're gonna have a really interesting conversation with someone who likes, loves fire just as much or maybe even more than I do. We're gonna be talking to Sandra Vlock, architect turned artist business person who has taken the idea of a gift for her brother and turned it into an entire business using metals and fire and flame to create meaningful art pieces that work in outdoor applications, indoor applications, and bring the beauty of art and fire and design to her clients across North America. Hope you enjoy. Is that a... Is that a real picture behind you or is that Actually, a... Actually, uh... well, no, uh, but where I am wouldn't be as uh, photogenic as, as the background that I've, I've uh, posted behind me. Fair enough. So that begs the question, where, where are you in the world? Well, right now I'm in Rancho Mirage, uh, the low desert of the Joshua Tree area. Mm-hmm. And um, the photo that you're seeing is actually a vineyard in Connecticut. Wow. With a fireball that has a uh, a, a harvest themed uh, uh, landscape. So cool! Wow, I, I love the uh, so Rancho Mirage is, if I'm not mistaken, right in the sort Palm of Palm Springs. Desert, Palm Springs area. Right. Mm-hmm. So I've been out, I've been out there a bunch of times. We were there for Modernism Week, right. and been out to visit. It's such a beautiful place to be. Yeah, and it's wow. it's uh, a few de- a few degrees cooler right now, so it's it's uh, it's it is lovely, it really is. I have in all of my time and travels, having lived in the Middle East, I've lived in Africa. Yeah. I have never seen a thermometer hit the temperature that it did when I was in Palm Desert last year. I, I just didn't know that it was just it was a level of heat I'd never experienced. Um, yeah, I've been working out here. Uh, I have a project that I'm doing with two uh, colleagues in um, on Avenue 50, which is where Coachella is, and um, just down the the street, essentially from the polo fields. And it was topping off at about 121 or 122 degrees this summer, so it was it was a little rough. I imagine so. Well, yeah. first of all, thank you. I, I wanted to thank you for, for making the time. I've been looking forward to our, to our discussion. I've been following your work since, yeah. uh, since Josh told me, uh, told me about you. So I've uh-huh. been very excited. Um, if it's okay, I, I'd love to first ask, I mean, uh, given what's going on uh, across the world, frankly, you mm-hmm. know, obviously in, in the U S and California being one of the, more challenged states, both with COVID and, and with the with the the fires going on. Uh, how is everything in in your world, in your community? How are how are you guys doing? Are you asking that to me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, asking, yeah uh, definitely. Yeah. Well, I've been living in um, Newport Beach since July. Um, uh, it, it seemed to be um, slowly moving to the West Coast. And uh, so I, I rented a house there. It, it sort of put me in proximity to the work that I'm doing here uh, in the Coachella Valley and to Los Angeles. Um, I think the impact is pretty evident. People need to be gathering out of doors. And um, very fortunately, Southern California has always been about that. Uh, where I uh, come from in Connecticut, there's a deep concern that with the weather changing, and it does, and it does very predictably like the first week in September, boom, uh, what are we going to do now? And uh, so I think a lot about those things um, because I put my energy prior to this, this pandemic to creating outdoor living space. The same thing that you have focused your own attentions on, um, memorable spaces and memorable and comfortable uh, has taken on a whole new meaning. I think the sense of comfort and uh, security, um, the opportunity to gather without worry and to be socially connected with physical distance. I think that sort of puts a, captures where we are 
just I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I'm just a little north of of Connecticut. I'm I'm up in oh. Montreal, so very similar. Uh, you know, not exactly the same weather, but pretty similar in that you know you get to Labor Day and there's this there's this real shift in the way people, uh, you know congregate entertain right. spend time outdoors just starts to get cooler and damper and, and darker as as you know so I, I completely agree with you it's it's we're really seeing this this shift and um i i, I see it really uh, it's an interesting thing i think the fall and winter could be very challenging in in this capacity you know i was I was talking to my wife about this a couple of days ago and sort of saying you know when this we came back we were in costa rica Mm -hmm. on our annual our annual holiday and we flew back to Montreal on March the 13th literally the day that everything was sort of going down mm -hmm. and but I recognize that that was going into longer days and warmer days and going into summer now it's almost the opposite the days are getting longer and darker and it's getting cooler so I I'm wondering how this is going to impact uh people in our lives and and how this need for outdoor, even in cool, even in winter, is going to, I think, be a very important part of people's well-being for the foreseeable future. Well, that's where I feel that um, the, the world of creativity really needs to kick in. And, um, and I'm referencing what, what you were doing and what I am doing um, as creating these environments. Um, it's not just providing an amenity. It really is the whole package. So it was one thing when restaurants shoved their tables outside and there were like Jersey barriers or some way to protect you from street traffic. Uh, now we're occupying not just the sidewalk, but, but city streets. Um, the emphasis is uh, very unfortunately not on the beautiful interiors of restaurants but on the outside where there's a lot less control, uh, but the need to have uh, a wonderful experience is why people go out. And so what are the components of the wonderful experience? And I kind of almost want to ask you and what you, what you do and how we could sort of complement that memorable, uh, wonderful experience in the outdoor space well i think that so you bring up a couple of really excellent points that i i sort of spend a lot of my life and time trying to to talk about mm -hmm. and even as you mentioned restaurants and the outdoor space activation if you look at what restaurants typically how thoughtful they are in the design of every color texture lighting mm -hmm. fire features as it relates specifically to what to what you do and, and your expertise and yet you know five feet away through a simple patio door is yes you've got tables and you've in most cases see these kind of inexpensive looking patio heaters with propane ah. tanks in them that look kind of so-so and don't really do much and don't smell all that great. And I constantly struggle, but which I think is the greatest opportunity for companies mm -hmm. like you and for us is to bridge the realm of possible mm -hmm. between indoor and outdoor on every level, aesthetically, functionality wise. So, you know, I, I see what you do and I've spent a lot of time on your website and your Instagram and I see what you do and it's, it's I, on a personal level, I, I'm really quite blown away. I, I absolutely love it. And I, I, you know, I grew up as a little bit of a, a little bit of a pyromaniac, py pyromaniac <laughs> kind of kid, like bonfire came from me as a kid lighting our bonfire pit. And there was, I loved it. There was something about the whole experience of it, the light, the warmth, the, the, the um, unpredictability of mm. it in some ways, having to sort of control something. And, and I see you doing that with your designs and these incredible features. Tell me, how did this, how did this start? How did this come to be? What inspired you? I'm, 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 I'm so excited well, to hear. Um, uh, the snapshot of me is that I, for all of my, I'll say professional life, I've, worked as an architect 
and uh, had my own practice for 30 years, uh, designing museums and uh, university buildings of every building type, uh, a lot of uh, community type spaces, whether it was um, municipal or otherwise, where a lot of people would be involved and, and the, the environment that responded to how people move through space, the choreography of that has always been really of great interest to me. And, um, and in addition, I never saw uh, that there was any artificial boundary between the indoor or the architectural built environment and the, the outdoor world. So about seven years ago, I'm, I'm dialing it back, uh, just as a, a random act of love, I designed a fire vessel that is of the same scale as this piece behind me, repurposing a mooring buoy to be something other than a fire pit as a gift. And uh, the random act of love is that it was for uh, my brother's 60th birthday, um, which was a pretty bold move since this wasn't something that could be, well, I'm not sure if I want it or I'm not gonna hang it on a wall. <laughs> you know, it's like there it arrived uh, as a complete and utter surprise. And, and um, the experience of doing that was, it was not only delightful to have made something that was so surprising, but the remarkable part was that it brought all of us together. So it wasn't just a gift that could be enjoyed by one, it was something that continued to give a lot of pleasure and opportunity to our family coming, coming together for a, a birthday celebration and just over time for any event or non-event that happened um, where the fireball was, was located. And in, in that case, it was on the Connecticut shoreline. The, uh, it captured the attention of more than my family and, and suddenly got published. Now, running an architectural practice, you want to get your buildings published, not, not something sort of off in left field. But it just opened a door for me to think about myself I'll say artistically, because I never imagined that I would put myself in the category of, uh, of, an, art, of an artist. I don't know why. <laughs> felt, felt like I needed to have more education uh, uh, behind that. But it turns out that all of my experience working as an architect really plugged into the notion of these functional fine art pieces. And they're, they're functional because that's what architecture is all about. It's form and function. And, um, and I never really wanted to separate myself from that activity. And so what I'm trying to accomplish as now that I'm fully engaged in this as um, fully engaged as a practice and as a business, and that's something kind of to talk about too, uh, in this world of non-gallery environments, uh, was to address these opportunities, just as you were mentioning restaurants moving outdoors and, well, there's a patio heater and there are the other things that keep us comfortable, but what do they really add to the experience? So the, the most recent um, concept that I've had that is, is now in production is a fire totem which takes, I don't know if you saw this on my, my website, but it, what it does, I'm sure you, you did see it. It takes the standard patio heater that we all love and adore that you can see from, from Rome to Mexico to New York to Rodeo Drive and reimagines it as something to be enjoyed as art that you live with. So the invention, so to speak, is not to reinvent the patio heater itself, but essentially to place an entire sleeve over it that is the artful uh, panel to it. So I saw, and I did spend 
quite a bit of time on your website, and I saw that you took the, you know, I, I don't know how many years ago it was, but the that glass centrifuge cylinder became yeah. popular versus the traditional mushroom right. type that heated from the pot. And your creation of the allowance for light to go from that glass cylinder outbound, rather than it just being a, a, a piece of black metal or whatever that is, to now actually take shape and form with the flame and turn into functional living art. I see that as, if, if I'm articulating right. it correctly, yeah. it, but that is exactly what takes an outdoor heater into an outdoor piece that turns this patio or terrace into an outdoor room. And that's what I think has been so desperately lacking both on a residential and on a commercial level for way too long. Just, just such an incredible gap in between yeah. the two experiences. No, I, was, I, I feel fortunate that I kind of spotted that. And, and that also was sort of random. Of A friend was moving. They had a patio heater that they were trying to offload. I sort of looked at it and said, I kind of want to play around with this. And um, just to be clear for anyone who hasn't seen this, the in place of the typical open grill that you would see on a patio heater that prevents you from putting your hand on the on the, the glass tube is a what I would call like an image panel, meaning that it's a design that I've created that is not abstract at all. It's very uh, contextual or fanciful um, imagery like behind me, which you can't really see in, uh, at such a distance. But if the fireball is yet another canvas for imagery that connects us to where we are or to a personal story, this was the same notion for me with the fire totem, where it had resonance to the place or to the people. And if we were going to the other extreme of even branding, that it was part of the design through thread of, it could be a restaurant, could be a, uh, an event space or a, a boutique hotel. Um, this is how I see it being deployed, so to speak, in this, in this form. Uh, one thing I should tell you is that uh, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, there was a run on toilet paper. Well, now there's a run on patio heaters. Yes. I mean, seriously, because they're all coming from mm -hmm. China. And so it's yep. quite fascinating. Um, fortunately for me, I've designed this to be used as a retrofit to all of the hundreds of thousands of these things that are mm -hmm. currently occupying beautiful spaces. So that's, that's the strategy. And are how involved are your clients in picking the actual design? Is this something that you have a series of that you offer as custom inspiration, like you said you did for your brother? I mean, I can yeah. make out in the back, obviously there's pattern and texture to it and having spent time on your site yeah. as well and how you articulate even the different types of from stainless to milled steel, like you really go into the, the actual core material in a very oh, yeah. profound, very profound way. Well, um, it can be very involved. Some people really like to leave their, their imprint, their thumbprint on a design. The same experience as working in architecture and architectural programming, as we like to say, where you invite people to, to participate or some people just don't, don't want to do that. And they say, you know, I like this. Um, because this is at basically the starting point of launching this, I'll call it a product, of uh, the functional fine art piece. Um, I can see it as being a, a, a limited series. It could take on uh, many different uh, forms or it's just a one, one at a time uh, commission. And um, when we talk about the business of being an, an artist, that's the, uh, that's the world that I'm trying to navigate right now where I can see this as being something that has uh, broad market appeal and that demands a certain price point or to be working with hospitality in a way that will also affect the price point. I know it sounds sort of funny to, to be into to talking about this as an artist, but 
that is the reality. And um, I, I hope in the end it changes the, the visual landscape in, in some small measure. I think that it will. And I think that it's usually a combination of a number of these different things that, you know, when, when, a, when someone experiences a space, they may not be able to articulate exactly one or two elements, but they f have a feeling for the overall, uh, you know, the overall and that there has been real thought um, put into each of these little, whether it's color, lighting, texture, uh, all of these aspects. And it's what brings sort of that harmonious thing together. And I, I was talking the other day with um, the very, very prominent designer. And we were talking about how the outdoor space, to your point, mm -hmm. it's a little bit of an executive summary for the home. Oh, you know, yeah. In a home, you have a kitchen, a dining room, living room, all those things. Outdoors, you have to take the highlights of each of those and it brings it all together into usually a much smaller space. So I think it's a much greater, the, the, the need for creative design, because it's A, a smaller space, and B, the executive summary has to be much more polished than the end product in many cases. It's putting both, again, a huge challenge, but also what an incredible opportunity for not only the, the lead designers on these spaces, mm -hmm. but almost more importantly, people like you who are adding these these features that are show-stopping, if you look at them, I mean, it, they, they really are just remarkable. They become focal points of the space. So it used the, the, the notion of an executive summary and made me think of how uh, way back when it used to be just curb appeal, you know, of, from the outside looking in. So you had your, you had shrubs and they were neatly trimmed and, and the walk up to the front door and the whole idea of home and, and, and how you get there has changed radically. I think the, uh, the emphasis now is not on the curb appeal, but the indoors looking out, <laughs> the indoors stepping out, the indoors outdoors blur the line. Um, something that I'm spending a lot of time thinking about and working with is shadow. So while there's a, Everyone is fascinated by fire. It's so dramatic and kinetic and, and, and magical, but so is light. And so when you think about an object outside, it's, not, it's never a uniform light unless it's overcast. And the light is always changing. It's from morning to sunset to, to darkness. And um, during the day, for example, as the sun sort of tracks across the sky, the impact of shadow, when you have something that is interesting that's being cast, is really remarkable. Suddenly the space is just that much bigger. So if you can imagine, let's say, a, a gate or a screen that's got some very, uh, an interesting design that, that captures the imagination, even as flat art, as soon as you've got light going through it, that shadow on the ground is just part of the sculpture of the piece. And um, it's, it's so amazing to me because architects always think about working with light. That's, a, that's kind of the number one thing in your toolbox. And it should be the same thing for exterior space. You know, perhaps I'm just saying the obvious, but um, it, it's had a, an enormous uh, impact on how I think about what I'm doing. And um, I would say that many people imagine landscaping as being primarily about the ground plane, what the surface material is, the sort of plantings, the color palette, the, sh the shade from, from sunlight that might be uh, a tree or a structure, but the idea that in a very temporary, fleeting way that design can also skate across that same landscape depending on what you put there makes it all the more dynamic. If you're following my, 
my story I, here. I, I very much am, and I, and I guess what I would ask is, you know, as you look at your website and you look at your, your Instagram, you can see that there is, and I'm not suggesting that it was a linear path. I know in art, it's very rarely is it linear. It's very much... Have you seen a, a shift or, or, or a change in what people are asking you for or what the realm of possibility is for as you take on different sizes of projects, shapes of project, yeah. material composition? And I read also on your website, there's the option of using either gas or uh, oh, live okay. wood yeah. Neither, or, or real wood in certain yeah. cases. Yeah, yeah, I, I, whatever, Which yeah. Would, huge differences in the way that light and that shadow, I mean, burning real wood and the, the sparks and the crackle compared to propane or natural gas yeah. is going to have a wildly different effect. How do you, how do yeah, you take that is a, That's kind of a farce reality, isn't it? I mean, there are not a lot of places that one would feel like they were being good environmental stewards of burning wood. And it's sad. The city of Montreal, and I'm sure there are many cities and 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 um, uh, states across the North America that are have done this or are starting to. But we are no longer allowed in the city of Montreal to have wood burning fireplaces yep. in in our homes. There's been a, a com com shift on it. So I've I've accommodated that where it's uh, in a fireball, for example, it, it could be either wood burning, like the big bonfire that you would love. Um, or with a propane burner ring that is covered with a media like a lava rock that has a natural appearance. I think that um, the other dimension to talk about, well, you, you, you've mentioned something really important, which is that the crackle of a fire, the smell, every, your whole, every sense is engaged. Yes. And another, I don't know if this is, part of the realm of the senses, but on an emotional level, authenticity is, is another important factor for me in what I'm doing. And I suppose in the environments that you're creating as well, in that there's things that make sense where you are. It's not a one size fits all outdoor space. And um, I don't think it's unfair or I don't think that um, for most design professionals that it would be unfair to say that prior to recently, and especially now, the outdoor space in terms of a line item on a budget wasn't the first thing that people thought about. And you still kind of, and I've recently spoken with a couple of uh, colleagues, landscape architects, who... Um, we're really affected by that, that you come in kind of last. And, um, and it's so important. It's so important to imagine a living, in, living space from the outside in, as well as the inside out. Whether it's a, a residential space or now anywhere else, where, what, what amount of outdoors can we occupy? And you know, back to the sense of authenticity, how does it really work with that? environment i think your point is 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 bullseye and it's something that we talk about all the time and i think there are a number of factors um that have played into that uh, first and foremost i think that very often the historic designer was an interior designer and they felt for whatever reason whether true or 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 not that their role in a project in a residential sort of stopped at the patio door right and it was someone else's hand so i think that was a factor i think one of the other big ones is the the idea of large glass walls and patio Ooh. doors and nano walls yep. are really only you know they've taken a lot of uh they've grown in popularity if you will oh, really sure. over the last 10 or 15 years yeah. where the the visual uh, connectivity of indoor and outdoor has never been as prominent as it is now. Absolutely. But I think one of the biggest factors of all of it is that for a long time there were there were just lacking options for the consumer and their design professional to activate the outdoor space in a functional and stylistic way that was aligned. And I've dealt with that in our business where you know the idea of outdoor kitchen 
still today, if you were to ask a thousand people to paint a mental picture of what that is, mm -hmm. my gut is that more than 90% of those would paint the traditional stone or stucco island that they see at the, you know, at the big box store or that it's been very hard to broaden the definition on the realm of possible. That's so interesting. You know, you mentioned Nanowall. Uh, my, my firm was like a poster child for Nanowall because we used their uh, folding glass wall on a, wasn't exactly a house, it was more like a pavilion, a very small footprint that was two stories. And because it was such a small footprint, back to your point about how the interior used to stop at the patio door, the interior of this pavilion was a, uh, it was a simple living space with a living room public space with two bedrooms above it. And so we used, because it was on the water, we used teak as the flooring. And now with the nano wall, we extended the teak out to be a, a very deep and luxurious uh, patio or terrace or porch. Uh, out into the landscape. And so suddenly the, the small 1,100 square foot <laughs> box, just like a shadow, well, now it's occupying a whole lot more space outside. Um, so that, you, you're right to say that these, sometimes it's the, the materials themselves, whether it's a, a fabric that doesn't degrade um, UV light, where now we can enjoy beautiful, things outside and really bring the sophistication um, to, to a whole different level. Great. But I, I'm interested, I have to ask you, what are, some of the, what, are, <laughs> what are some of the things that you've thought about for the, the outdoor kitchen that just hasn't been adopted yet or, or needs to be done? Is there something that we can do together to... Uh, be provocative and say, hey, well, you know, it could be this. Well, I would absolutely love to seeing seeing your designs. I mean, it, it is so aligned with what we are we are doing. Um, I think at a first the at a preliminary level, we are trying to move away, and we as we as a company are mm -hmm. removing the term outdoor kitchen, and everything we do is focused on your kitchen outdoors. And just in making that minor tweak in the ordering yeah. of words, we're changing. Oh, we're changing yeah. the we're changing the the discussion. Yeah. And the discussion from where we sit, and again, a lot of this stems from my own and my my business partner Stefan's uh, childhood experiences. We're growing up in very country like yeah. settings. We lived in the city, but our summers were spent with our families in nature or at, uh -huh. at the lake. And I fundamentally believe that people have greater experiences, memories, uh, enjoyment with their themselves, with their spouses, with their families, with their friends, with their communities in outdoor environments versus indoor ones. And I, I, I can't necessarily articulate why, mm. but I do know that when you're outdoors, you can see that crackle of fire and you have a much greater chance of experiencing, as you said earlier, just the sun shifting mm -hmm. and the impact of that on, on, on light and on shade and on an environment and how a deck can change its entire identity in a six hour cycle, but a living room really can't. Well, maybe, so maybe what it is, is that there, um, what's the right word? It's not contained space. There's a sense of possibility in the outdoors, whether it's a very long view, even if you're in a tiny uh, space. I remember when uh, I spoke with Josh and he was uh, leading this panel discussion and he's sitting, I guess, with the, the backdrop of his, uh, his deck with a railing and, and sort of sharing how, thank God, there was a little bit of outdoor space to enjoy. Well, that outdoor space, even if, it can, even if it's small, can capture a long view. It can, ex it can still expand into some other space, even if you don't own it. And uh, up or down, 
So the outdoor space, you know, people are swinging lights and kind of having fun with the idea that, oh, it's not just eight feet of height that I have to work with, the standard room height, but sky's the limit. So it's not so much the footprint, but sky's the limit in a lot of cases. And I think people have a more um, holistic approach to outdoors and are prepared mm. to realize that outdoors doesn't have to be perfect. Mm. to be incredible and to be memorable where I think sometimes we get maybe a little overzealous on every micro detail of indoor design and that's not to take away from the importance yeah. of a finish or or a mitered edge or a joint or a light and I, I acknowledge those are important but outdoors those don't seem to be as important as the overall environment and if you look at the way people whether it's Fourth of July, or 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 a birthday, or a backyard barbecue. There's something more fun about being invited to a backyard barbecue than to a dinner party, especially in today's day and age. There's just a bit of a a lightning to to that. Yeah. And I think, and I think about this a lot. I, I think this actually comes from a very deeply rooted place from our childhoods, mm. because the the best elements of our youth and the most creative that we had to be by virtue of physical environment was outdoors. Yeah. Indoors, there were confines of walls and lights. And today with kids, it's all about, well, how come you don't go outside and build a fort? Why are you playing video games all day? Yeah. Outdoors, you don't have those restrictions. You have to create worlds and games and imagination. And that was, that was my experience. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and you're, you're making me think of another uh, example about taking liberty. Well, number one, when you're outdoors, you don't have to wipe your feet. <laughs> you, you can be casual. You don't have to be so concerned. And so there's this sense of freedom in that regard. But um, I did a project uh, not too long ago. It's a pool house a, and pool pavilion. But it, 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 honestly, it was... It had everything in it that it could have been a house. I would have been happy in it. But when we started the project, the, the main house was frankly the very uh, nondescript, just big. And, but they had a lot of land, they had a beautiful pool, and they wanted to do something as a pool amenity. And uh, there was absolutely nothing to draw from in terms of the, the architectural integrity of the home. I mean, if anything, run away. <laughs> you know, it was really just kind of a, a, a developer spec house looking piece of property, albeit a beautiful landscape. And I remember telling uh, the client, he said, you know, this can be a complete and utter departure. Maybe I was saving myself. But I said, it can be anything. You, let's just use our imagination. It can be really, uh, I wasn't going to say a fantasy exactly, but it can be an utter departure from what the house is now. And it's exactly the path that we took. We designed the most, yeah, it's really a lovely uh, space uh, that has nothing to do with the architecture of the house, but has everything to do with the outdoor, the outdoor environment there. And um, I think that's kind of where you're going too, except for now we're all grown up. <laughs> where it's like, oh, you know, we're pouring concrete for this thing, you know, as opposed to digging in the sandbox. But there is that sense of freedom and to be, uh, to use your imagination in any number of ways. But I also think to that point, a lot of people today who are, are just understanding what can be done outdoors. And I think that's one of the reasons yeah. why even, even before the, you know, the, the impact of COVID, and that focal on let's do things outdoors because we're not taking vacations. We don't want carpenters yep. or tradespeople inside the home. Uh, we're not having a 250 person wedding, whatever the reason may be. I think it's because the outdoor space in most people's homes, even very affluent ones, mm -hmm. lags behind yeah. on a stylistic and on a, on a, on a level where they integrate. Um, and I think that's really the, what we're seeing as, yeah. as the lift on this. Well, I think you've thrown down the gauntlet. I mean, that is that is it, and I it doesn't it it, all, it only excites me more to realize that there is so much ground 
to cover here. There's so many opportunities to uh, invent and to inspire. And I think that that is a collaborative move. It's one thing, and, and I, I should say in speaking about me, since <laughs> it's an interview, uh, I'm a collaborator. And when you say, well, do you have a line of, I said, well, I could. I could have, well, this is what I do. But I'm, I, I would choose to uh, be collaborating on, all, on many different levels in the design and, and concept development of well, what we're of talking what, about or anything else. Well, none of what any of us do, and this has been one of the things that we have learned is the traditional, you know, and I'll use the words this way, the traditional outdoor kitchen was very much appliance centric oh, or focused right. comparative, comparatively to the indoors. And that's yeah. what we've been trying desperately as, as a company and as a brand to sort of change and say, you know, it's not based on picking a barbecue and everything else follows around it. It's what do you want to do with the space and that, right. you know, the that idea so here's one thing i want actually it leads into a great question i think your product somewhat similarly to ours is that there is a codependence from your perspective on a burner and will lava rock which you mentioned earlier will that create the effect on or a positive or or, or negatively we have a similar situation where yes we make this cabinetry line and planters and accessories but in almost all cases, there is refrigeration equipment or grills or pizza ovens and a need for countertops. So we are, there's three legs to the outdoor kitchen stool. We're one and we try to be one of the big ones, but yeah. we are interdependent on other yeah. factors to holistically bring the project together at the consumer level. I love it. And that has, you tell me about your experience. Do you feel there's any limitations? Because, oh, I wish there Absolutely was a burner I could do. Beautiful. Absolutely not. I, uh, we, you're talking about your, your life outdoors. Um, I'm designing a shade structure right now, which is based on the simple lean-to. These, these things that you can recall, and, and probably most people listening to us have no idea what a lean-to is. A lean-to is this, and it's just a... Um, it protects you from the elements, not all of them, but rain, snow, uh, uh, sunlight. And there's just kind of an iconic shape to me, it's as simple as it is. But in this case, the top surface is going to have a, a designed uh, steel pattern to it of stars and sun and moon and you know the things which are relating to where it is in the desert in this case and um the codependency here is that well we need to provide shade it needs to it needs to work within the courtyard uh walls uh it needs to service a pool area so that there's a place to retreat I'm talking about the heat in the desert oh yeah I mean, everything is about that, the scorching Western light. And it's just being attentive to those sort of details that make each space unique. But the codependency, I think, at a fundamental level right now, us talking, is to think about what isn't out there. What would people enjoy? What would really be the, 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 the opportunity to expand the field um, in a way that it's not just the appliances. We all know what that looks like. Some countertops are longer, some are concrete, some are something else, um, you know, material selections. Uh, that, and I don't know what all of those elements are, but this is a moment to stretch the imagination. And I think anybody reading the architectural press or any or, or any creative mind is engaged in this same thought process what else what else can we think of 
I could not agree with you more. And I think that one of the things that has driven design for its entire history, I don't know when that started, maybe when, you know, they invented the wheel, <laughs> is to push the boundaries and invention. try. It was pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> but to test the boundaries. And I think that the indoors went at a certain pace and velocity that the outdoors did not. And that's one of the reasons why I think that it really advanced or, or that the, the outdoors potentially was slower to um, react to consumer wants, behaviors, aesthetic and functional needs. And to your point, it's, it's playing catch up right now yeah. at every level. So I'm thrilled that there are companies out there, you, us, and, and countless others who are prepared to push the boundaries and try things and tweak and fail and adjust. And, you know, I say all the time, you know, Steve Jobs didn't say, let's make one iPhone and yeah. we're done. <laughs> of course not. We're good. And I think it's, it's the progressive people and companies in this industry that are taking those risks and are that that's really the future and that's how ultimately we're going to advance on on every level and i i think it's a beautiful thing to watch yeah and and to participate in absolutely i i'm uh i, I am constantly in love with with what i do literally every day mm -hmm. it's an amazing feeling after almost uh it took me till 44 years old to find that level of being truly in love and enamored with what I do every day. And it's just, it, it feels like somebody has to pinch me. So it's, it's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Um, I've really enjoyed speaking with you and I, I will continue to follow your work. I, I absolutely love it. And I believe um, for the first time since starting this podcast and speaking with a number of designers and architects, um, yeah. Over the last month, I believe there is absolutely some amazing collaboration that our two companies can do together. And I, I genuinely look forward to that. Um, I, I do, too. Thank you so much. What fun. This is Ryan Bloom. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Fireside Chat with Sandra Vlock. I hope you learned I certainly did how the use of fire and texture and light and shadow can leave incredible inspiration on outdoor space. I think we saw tremendous alignment on vision of turning outdoor spaces into rooms and creating lasting memories with art pieces and effect that really are now encapsulating what people and designers are looking for in their outdoor spaces. Thanks for joining us. And as always, please follow us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, and please sign up so you can enjoy future episodes of the Fireside Chat. We want to hear from you. Please share your voice, share your questions, and share your comments. And as always, we appreciate your time. Thanks.